Okay. So just before I start, I feel I should warn you, this is City Side 1, the Apple Q&A is next door. Um, but uh, for those of you who have, have taken the, the red pill, um, welcome. Um, my name's Jeff Lowe. Uh, I work at a company called Metadata Solutions. Uh, I'm a principal innovation scientist there, um, and our primary business is building software for clinical trials, so data capture and everything like that. Um, the purpose of my presentation today is just giving a lot of you who may have a little bit of understanding about what goes on in a clinical trial, just a wee bit more sort of uh, um, coverage about it and start looking for opportunities to where we can start working, to look where we can start working together because it's such a painful process at the moment for all concerned um, when I'm talking about the, the sponsors, I'm talking about the sites and I'm talking specifically about the patients as well because that's the most important thing. So what we're going to talk about um, today is sort of just an overview of what a research trial is, um, what do we actually need to do as part of the data collection for a clinical trial, um, and then look at some of the opportunities we, that we on the research side are starting to see uh, with respect to the use, re use and reuse of healthcare data and research. So just as a bit of background, I'm sure you're all aware when you look at the bill uh, for any time you go to the doctor, I'm assuming obviously in the US, it's less so in the in the European Union, um, is quite a large industry. Um, uh, sales are around 1.1 trillion in uh, 2017, and that's just in the US, of course. Um, but one of the things sort of comes part and parcel with that is you need to actually uh, get these drugs in the hands of people. And what we're discovering, sort of, uh, for reasons that are, I'll go into a wee bit, is it's actually getting more and more expensive to uh, get a drug to market which is kind of counter to, counter to what you would imagine in terms of we're getting better at data collection, we've got uh, activities like machine learning to get, draw more sort of context or interest from the, from the data itself, but still it's costing more and more money to actually drugs to market. And uh, sort of the analysis of this comes down to like sort of four main areas. The first one's the so-called better than the Beatles problem in terms of a lot of the, market, the drugs that are coming to market aren't really, they're not blockbusters, they're not, not new drugs by and large. A lot of them are sort of subtle reformulations or slightly better statins, for example, uh, which, it, which are obviously good for the company itself, but it becomes harder and harder to actually prove the value of that drug. So if you're bringing something to, to the market which is slightly better than something else, you've got to spend a lot more time capturing a lot more data to actually prove that the drug itself is better um, and has value when you're trying to sell it to the, the insurance companies and trying to sell it to the national health systems. Uh, the course uh, is regulated is the other one. Um, obviously, there's been a, a number of very, very large uh, snafus, for want of a better word, in the drug industry where um, this might spend extensive collection of data, extensive analysis, everything like that. We still get through and we find um, patterns of... Uh, like un unexpected events or serious adverse events. Uh, the, the ones that probably spring to mind at most are uh, Vioxx in, in the most recent memory. Um, so the regulators themselves are kicking back to say, okay, have you, have you tested, have you looked at more and more of this data? We don't want to, be, to have another one of these things on our hands. Um, again, this, this is uh, like the, the mythical man month situation where uh, in the past, the, well, if you thought you had a problem you had to solve, well, the easiest way you could solve it is by throwing more people at it, um, which is sort of the way you'd think. The trouble was, obviously, that never actually works. It ends up being sort of about 50% uh, uh, about longer um, if you just left with the steady as steady, steady can be. So they're throwing more and more resource to try and get these studies done quicker and quicker, and it's turning out that they're actually taking longer and costing more. And the, the final one is... A lot of the low-hanging fruit has kind of been picked at this point. So you, you get into drugs which are much more sophisticated, the way they act with the human body, uh, are much more uh, innate. Um, and in a lot of cases, we don't actually understand it completely. Uh, so we, we pick up a, a drug or a specific compound, we try it out, we think we understand how it works, then we start giving it to patients themselves and we see things that we hadn't anticipated. And you have to go back to the drawing board. So a lot of the... Uh, it's a lot harder to actually work out what these drugs do because the, the, the targets themselves are much more sophisticated. So there's a, a sort of an estimate, and this obviously goes up and down depending on who you're talking to, but they, they reckon it takes about 12 years to get to market or around uh, 1.15 billion pounds. So that's um, obviously in sterling. 
But what in and of itself is is the sort of the base, the reason for running a clinical trial. You need to be able to prove that uh, this compound or this intervention, we're not just talking about drugs themselves, we're also talking about new medical devices, um, even some uh, the types of treatments you could do, uh, like uh, psychological, those sorts of things. You need to be able to prove that this intervention, which is sort of that high level term, is uh, safe, i.e. it doesn't cause more problems than it cures. Um, and it's efficacious, and this leads back to the better than the Beatles problem in terms of you need to be able to prove that the drug actually does what it says it's going to do. There's two sort of generally main types of clinical trials, um, or two types of trials. There's the clinical trial. Um, they're generally broken down to things like uh, uh, open label, uh, blinded, placebo controlled, just different types of interventional uh, experiments where you actually give somebody a drug and look to see what happens. The other one is observational, where you don't actually get involved with them quite so much. All you do is you gather their data and then you see what, what um, insight you can draw from that at the end of the day. But either way, we need data and we need lots of it. So this is a, this is a nice uh, diagram that I found, um, the reference see in the corner there, um, which talk, talks about the, sort of the high-level uh, process of getting a, a drug through. Uh, obviously, you have to find the drug for its staff. Uh, the, the, all the preclinical stuff happens before this. You find a compound, you identify it based on maybe uh, a deeper understanding of proteins, for example, uh, that, and then you're committing to actually putting together a study. You, you start off by creating a, uh, defining the uh, study, how it's going to work. You put together some documents um, uh, which cover the what you're going to do as part of the study, how you're going to analyse the data, how you're going to prove one way or another that the drug is safe, how you're going to prove one way or another that it is efficacious. Um, then you spend quite a bit of time uh, within the, the data collection phase. Uh, we start off with part uh, participant enrolment, where we start pulling people in, um, or identifying patients or suitable patients for the study itself, uh, and collect data for a period of time. Uh, how long you collect the data depends on what phase the study is. Uh, um, there's sort of basically four main stages of, or phases of study. There's phase one where you just actually look at the profile of the drug, how it, uh, it works in, in, in a normal person for a want of a better word, see how it sort of it, um, decays, those sorts of, it's sort of, uh, you start off at very low and you look to see whether or not there's any adverse events or anything like that. And then you get into phase two and three when you actually start looking at its benefit for fit therapeutic users. Um, and then, uh, Phase four is sort of more post-marketing. When you've done all your studies, you've proved that it works with the sample population that you put into your study, and then you just keep an eye on it. You run uh, studies on like different, different ethno ethnographic groups. Um, a, a great example is, for example, um, the, the metabolism of, of Japanese people, Asian people, is different to the metabolism of Western people. So quite often they run post-marketing studies in Japan just simply because they're not absolutely 100% sure the drug is going to work the way they, they thought it might. After they've done all this data collection, they spend a lot of time cleaning it, a lot of time putting it together into tables, listing the figures, and then at the end of the day, you submit it to the regulatory agency. So in the US, it's obviously the FDA. Um, in the UK, it's the MHRA. Um, uh, basically, these groups are the ones that give you the go, no-go um, on the drug itself for, uh, or permission to market it. The document that, that, that's key, um, obviously, to everything is the the clinical trial protocol. The clinical trial protocol is for a, an individual study within sort of a, a wider program because, um, like I said, there's a number of different phases in terms of how you're going to run the study. Um, clinical trial program uh, it, protocol talks about a single study, a single intervention where you have one or more um, outcomes and endpoints, um, uh, sort of breakdown of how you're going to collect the data, the, the types of uh, this, this concept, like, for example, study arms. You want to compare that the drug... Um, works equally, the, the placebo-controlled study is an example where you say, okay, I'm gonna give, 50% well, of the population are gonna get a, sh a sugar pull, I want for a better word, and the other 50% are gonna get the drug, and that's intended to wipe out the, the placebo effect. That sort of study design goes into the protocol document itself. It also includes what we call the schedule of activities, the schedule of events, which includes all the activities you're gonna do as part of the study. So it includes um, like encounters when you're gonna see the, the investigator, um, what procedures you're actually going to do when you go in and, and talk to the, the investigator themselves. It's really important for actually defining everything. This is a doc This is a controlled document. It's versioned, uh, it's very much mannered, and this is the one that goes to regulators for review. It also goes to the institutional review boards. Um, if you don't get past the institutional review board, you're not even going to be able to run the study in a particular site. And one of the things I wanted to, to give an example of 
as part of the uh, clinical trial protocol is defining your patient population, and that's done through something called eligibility criteria. Um, it, it, bro it broadly breaks down to two types. There's the inclusion criteria, which um, is a set of criteria which prospective participants must match, um, and the exclusion, which is obviously the vice versa. Um, I've put asterisks on there because there is actually quite often uh, a, a degree of investigative discretion to say, um, in some cases, if, if, if you're talking a very, very small patient population, the investigator can um, overrule one of these, one or, uh, one, of these, one or more of these. One of the problems we've had in the past in terms of being able to identify patients is the way, a lot of it boils down to the way we express the inclusion exclusion criteria. They're written by medical writers who are physicians, um, and they have a particular turn of phrase, which really it has a lot of difficulty being decomposed into something machine processable. So in this case here, we've got male or female, female patients with a diagnosis of PH or uh, persistent recurrent chronic T, uh, CTE PH. Age greater than or equal 18 years, well, that's relatively simple. Um, baseline six-minute walk this test. This is the list of all these things here. But there... A lot of these things, uh, a lot of the rules themselves are written uh, in a very composite way, so it becomes very difficult for machines to process. Similarly, exclusion criteria, hypersensitivity to nickel. That's just saying that one of the, the interventions they're going to use as part of the study is a Fitbit, and the Fitbit class has nickel on it, so you don't want to admit patients into the study for that. So any of these sorts of things, medical condition or history and such would impair the patient's ability to participate or complete the study in the opinion of the investigator. Try turning that into a, ser into a series of yeah, where ifs. Um, enrolled in pulmonary re uh, re rehabilitation program within the last six months, already participating in, in a interventional study. So I've just taken a, a, a selection here and actually turned them, like they are very, quite simplistic themselves, but um, we have a case here, age, age greater than 18 years, obviously we can do a patient, a query on the patient resource, male or female, same sort of thing. The condition, or the, the condition um, one or other, they're talking about one of these things, I think it's probably exclusive or I don't know if you can have these two things at the same time, I'm not a clinician, um, and then a not. So, the, the first block there are a series of ands, and then there's or in the middle in there, and then there's not. So actually composing that into a series of uh, uh, queries you might need to run becomes quite difficult. Um, there, is, there has been some suggestion of actually making that sim simpler to implement, um, but the medical writers can be a bit uh, particular. Um, so here's an example of just some code that I put together to, to illustrate um, how you can do this. This is obviously using, it's written in Python, it's using the Fire Client, which uh, Pascal wrote. Um, uh, so obviously there's some very simple ones there about pulling out particular uh, uh, um, conditions like uh, gender, uh, age, and everything like that. Um, and then this, this uh, example here, um, there's a number of clinical trial registries across the world, which basically we register your study for when, to let people know that it exists so they can find it. Um, and they tend to do these things using uh, uh, mesh terms. So essentially this is the kind of thing you would start putting together to start identifying patient, patient participants for your study. Um, the, the code itself is all up on the, that site there. Uh, there's also exercises which reference that. Now you might say, well, these, these seem relatively simple. What's the, what's the benefit of it? Well, uh, but as stated there, approximately 29% of the clinical trial cost is down to, to recruitment, identifying subjects. 29% of whatever they're spending. Um, so if we could actually get to the, posi the position where we could use fire resources like to identify patients of pop uh, popula sorry, populations of patients from systems automatically, then we, we could be saving up to $37,000 a, $37, a, a day in terms of the recruitment process. We would also, I mean, you might be looking at the dollar sign thinking, well, that's very cynical of you, but it's also uh, like sh shrinking the amount of time it's going to take you to get that drug to market. And if these drugs are like genuinely going to improve people's lives, then I think we have a moral responsibility to try and facilitate that as much as possible. So there is a, there is a dollar value associated with it, but there's also like a human value associated with it. Now, we're not the first people to, to obviously look at... Um, uh, some of this clinical trial perspective. There's, there's been some projects um, already run within the fire work stream. So there was the structured data capture stream, which I think Lloyd's presenting on tomorrow, in fact. Um, and under that, uh, there was a couple of resources that were put together that we're 
looking to use, and I'm just going to sort of cover them very briefly in a minute. Um, so they're, they're kicked off as part of the structured data capture stream. Um, that went away to a degree, but uh, since that time, the, the biomedical research and regulatory group have taken those resources on and, and are, are sponsoring them, stewarding them through the, pro, the, through the ballot process. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of the Biomedical Re uh, Research and Regulatory Group, it's a conglomeration of the old ARCRIM, which is the Research-Centred uh, Reference Information Model Group, and the Bridge Working Groups. Um, Bridge is a, is a model that was intended, well, was intended to harmonise the, the, the two different domains, the, the healthcare and the research. Um, it, it's, it's arguable whether it's been able to do that, but it is, it's still carrying on as it is. So the first one we're going to look at is the research study. So it's obviously capturing the information about the study. So if you were to take um, a protocol, this is what you would get out of that. Um, so the, the resource itself, I don't know how well that's going to show up. It's, it's pretty well. So there's, um, this is still the, the, the research study and research subject are actually under a sort of more active review. So there's a couple of differences between the, the two levels. So I've, I've got both copies here. But the key constituents are quite obvious. Um, there's obviously a, an identifier for the study, the, the title, um, the protocol. Now, this is one that I'm going to talk about in a bit, but it's kind of interesting because it's, it's one, one place that is, serves as a really good opportunity for us to work together on. Uh, the status. Uh, the status of a study can be in any one of a number of states. Um, uh, these things are can be quite uh, fluctional in terms of, say, they discover a an issue with the drug in one of the centres, they'll shut them down and all the other ones, they, they will stop recruitment and other ones to make until they're, they're sure it's all okay. Um, there's things there which will help you actually find a study because the, the biggest thing about it is if you have a, a study itself is usually associated with a compound, obviously, or an intervention itself, um, and a particular one or more therapeutic areas which are just conditions themselves. So there's a lot of the queries that you could do based on that. Um, but it all, in of itself, it's, it's a good coverage um, for what we can use uh, at this point. Um, uh, the, I, I talked very briefly about the arms. The arms are basically, um, from a high level, they summarise a path for a patient through a, a, a study itself. So some, um, some studies are designed in such a way that you actually have a different path depending on what disease you are. So say you have a study that's running both asthma and COPD, the types of assessments you'll do on, the, on those sort of patients, even though you're using the same interventional uh, method, will be different. I and mean, you'll be randomised to one of those arms or you'll be allocated to one of those arms based on your underlying disease. And so it's intended within this resource to be able to represent that. Uh, references to the sites. So again, a lot of this is about sort of advertising that, that the study exists and you're able to find it. The ones that have really changed between the two are, uh, so a lot of the, uh, the clinicians got involved, uh, or the, I don't actually think they were necessarily clinicians, they were more sort of uh, clinical trial operators, so CROs and those sort of thing, things. So the, the status systems themselves have become a lot more um, pinned down, I guess. So there's a lot more different options. Um, but they're intended to, to give you better information as a, as a person who's consuming this resource uh, about the status of the study. Is it um, active? Uh, are you going to be able to recruit patients into it? Um, does it make sense to do that? Um, the, one of the things that I, I think was, was very good in the, in the R4 resources, uh, in R3 they had a, a single entity uh, called FOCUS, which talked about the focus of the study. Um, which was, it could be one or, or, or two things. One of them could be the actual medication or the intervention that was being used. And the other one was the, the condition. So both of those things were encapsulated in the same um, attribute. Uh, that's obviously now been split out. So you can actually sort of do a more discrete search uh, for a condition um, because it is its own um, attribute. So some of the uses, uses we could see for a research study. Um, Study registration, obviously, you want to have some record of the study um, uh, in the EHR system. And I'll talk about the research subjects in a minute because that's kind of tying all together. But it, it allows you to have some way of representing information from a protocol document uh, in a machine processable way so that you could actually find it um, and, and draw sort of actionable insights based on that. That's a big word, but it, it's kind of, it, it's about making the, it's having a way of exchanging this information. There have been a number of attempts on the clinical research side to try and build a model for protocols. Um, I wouldn't say they've been overly successful. Uh, the, the trouble with a, a protocol itself is 
everybody's convinced that their way is, is the right way. Um, and uh, so there's been a lot of attempts to try and harmonise uh, the underlying model of, of the protocol itself, be able to represent the information the same way for the reasons that we've talked about prior. Uh, and just up to now, there hasn't been kind of the, the impetus on the research side to really tie it all together. Um, there has been some work done by the, the Transcelerate group to try and actually do that. So they've got a common protocol template. Um, and the, the big thing was, I talked about the fact that the medical writers are the people who write the protocols. They are very opinionated and very difficult to sell, anything, sell new ideas to. So they're quite conservative, which is quite something considering our industry is, is generally pretty conservative. The other thing you can do about it is you can actually register, you can actually allow people to be able to find studies based on like attributes. So um, uh, this is the one where it becomes quite interesting for the like CDS hooks or subscription um, uh, resources where you want to be able to say you find someone who's been newly diagnosed with a particular condition. You want to know if there's clinical studies out there. There was a study uh, relatively recently which said. Um, I think if given the opportunity, 90% of pe all people would, would participate in, in a clinical study. Um, and that was sort of from a, from a, uh, more, well, from a humanic uh, perspective rather than, because you, you can't, like, you can't uh, recompense people as part of the clinical study because that introduces all sorts of biases. But um, allowing people to actually find these studies would be absolutely amazing, and especially if you could do it in such a way as you could install uh, a clinical decision support hook um, in a number of EHR systems, and then any time any patient comes up and says, with a particular condition, you could pop it up and say, okay, here's a research study that they are uh, suitable for attending. So suddenly you're actually taking the, taking the study to them rather than actually having to go and find it yourself. And then finally, uh, registering the subject. You need to be able to register a subject to a study. Um, uh, I don't have a wee bit of time. So I've got an example here. So in this case, um, like I said, there's, there are clinical trial registries. Um, and so, where are we? So, uh, so the clinical trial, the biggest cl clinical trial registry is obviously the clinicaltrials.gov, um, which is run uh, in the US, I can't remember the company, the organisation who run it. But essentially, any time you're going to, if you're going to run a study in the in North America, you have to have registered the study uh, with clinicaltrials.gov um, before you're allowed to, to start. Um, that includes a lot of sort of key information, and again, intended to try and uh, allow people to find studies, uh, work out, allow investigators to find studies, not necessarily just participants. Uh, the clinicaltrials.gov is. It's a pretty well maintained model, but one of the things I've always thought would be kind of interesting is to see whether or not we could kind of bring their representation of the data um, together with, uh, for example, the research study. So I've got a, a little bit of code here, which is somewhat hard to see. Um, But again, it's um, so I've written a wee library which which will pull down pull down because you can download the the trial specifications from clinicaltrials.gov just as an XML document, um, and I've written a, a wrapper around that to extract all the at, the relative and attributes um, from that. So one of the, the the attributes themselves is you want to be able to identify all the locations in which the study is running. Um, clinicaltrials.gov will allow you to capture um, the countries in which the study is running, um, the actual sites, some of the investigators, um, and identify the people who are involved. So essentially, I've just written a little wrap around this. The, this is also available on GitHub. You can download it, and it will um, pull the XML document down and then render it as a series of attributes. And then we can start mapping those attributes across to fire resources. So this is an example of, um, there was, you remember there was the, the keywords as a way of finding the study. Well, similarly in the um, clinicaltrials.gov, they have a couple of keywords, or they have a series of keywords that you can use for looking up the, the drug, uh, looking up the study itself based on uh, drugs or, um, or, sorry, intervention or condition. Um, so essentially we, we kind of pull all of those things into one uh, attribute collection and then we can then just load them across into the, uh, the research study resource. So again, I mean a lot of this was kind of, 
was interesting to me because uh, I think one of the, the problems we have at the moment for people who are looking to implement some of these re these research resources uh, sorry research resources uh, is there aren't enough examples. So the resource itself has been published, but there's no examples. So anybody who wants to come along and pick it up is kind of a wee bit out sea because they don't have some examples to look at. I don't know about you, but when I'm certainly looking at new resources, I spend a lot of time looking at the examples because they help like discombobulate some of the ideas in your head. So. So the next one is the research subject. So this is predicated on the fact that you actually have built a research or registered a research study in um, the system of choice. And essentially what this does is it ties off um, the connection between uh, a patient, who is obviously an entity within the, a resource within the EHR system, and a, a research study. So then you can, um, it also includes things, uh, information about arm allocations and like that, but it, it's basically the join between these two things. Because obviously uh, in uh, the healthcare system, I as a patient have a particular resource, so I have an NHS number, um, but I don't want to share that with a pharmaceutical company, so I need to have some way of bridging that. So in the EDC system, um, I have a, an identifier, subject one, two, three, four, for example. What this, the research subject does is it allows you to have those two, it exists as those two entities in the two different systems without necessarily tying them together because it's, it's very, very bad if the pharmaceutical company ever gets any sort of personally identifying information which would allow them to identify the subjects. So uh, again, um, this one's reasonably simple in terms of there's not a lot to it, there's not a lot you need uh, around it, but again, it just ties off the, the identifier, um, the re reference to the study, the reference to the individual, the patient themselves. The, the identifier in this case would be probably the, the subject one, two, three, four, five, as an example. Um, their status, whether or not they're interested in taking part in a study, whether they're actually participating in a study, whether they um, didn't meet the, the requirements, the eligibility criteria, uh, requirements to take part in a study, whether they completed a study on time, whether they withdrew from a study. Each of these are states on the, the uh, states or subject milestones for people who are taking part in a, in a clinical study. Um, and this is a great resource for, for being able to kind of tie that together because um, information about whether or not you're going to take part in a study may exist in a, in a completely different system. But because it's an open resource, I mean, uh, if, if we have a decision that's made by a pharmaceutical company not to move forward with the patient or something like that, you can just push that back as a, as a put request. Um, and voila, um, the, the data is harmonised. Uh, there's not as many changes here apart from a lot more statuses. Um, again, based down to sort of more operational re requirements. Um, I have a wee bit of a problem in between the, the, R3, the S2U3 and the R4 in terms of it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one mapping between the two. Uh, in the previous one, you had an active, and this one here, you've got several, which would be, uh, um, which could be considered as active. So you've got to try and like bridge those two things would be a wee bit sort of conceptually difficult to do. It also includes information like uh, the arm that they've been assigned to, but sometimes they're actually, they're assigned to an arm, but they don't actually do that arm. I haven't seen many cases for that, um, because usually we're not, uh, the systems themselves aren't that um, sophisticated. Once you're on a path, you're on a path. Um, it also includes, quite interestingly, the, the consent attribute there. Um, at the moment, consent documents are, are just that. They're, uh, they have been for a long time, just electronic uh, basically, doctors, uh, files that have been signed and put on uh, on site, and then there's a, a date in the EDC system which says that this was the date at which they signed informed consent. Um, there's a lot more e-consent going on now, where systems are allowing patients to, to get a better idea of, of what they're consenting to as part of the study. Um, actually, having the consent linked in the EH, uh, EHR system to the research subject is, is pretty interesting because it allows you to sort of look at that and maybe refresh it from time to time as the protocol changes. So there's some uses which stick out. Obviously, subject registration is, is the first one. Um, being able to find anybody who's on a study. Um, say, for example, you discovered, I mean, this is like pie in the sky. This is ridiculous. It, it wouldn't be as, as difficult as this. But say you discovered there was an a, a, a undisclosed serious adverse event for a particular uh, compound. You wanted to stop all subjects who were taking that particular compound. Well, this would be a good way to do it. You could look for the... Uh, 
the focus here. You could do a query on the focus and find all the subjects in the, in the research system that are associated with him. Um, and also because, the, like I said, there, it's a join between the healthcare system and the research system. So we could use that as basically the, 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 the um, if we were to do a transaction post in a bundle with all the clinical data, that would be the, the glue that would join a subject uh, or a patient with a subject where those uh, they're in the two different systems. Now, with respect to the data capture itself, uh, it, it's pretty obvious a lot of this, uh, what we're trying to do. We need to capture sort of uh, safety-related data, so labs, um, vital signs, ECG, those sorts of things. Um, demographic information, again, is pretty much the, the patient resource, for want of a better word. Um, and those are, the, those are sort of the more general ones. So we still need to capture that information. We need to capture it in a, in a reasonable way. Now, the way we used to do this back in the terrible old days was um, all the, the forms themselves, which are called case report forms, were sent out in a, in a massive booklet uh, to the site. And any time you put a new subject on, you would, you would enter all the data. You would, whatever systems you had alongside, you would then go and copy that data across onto these forms, tear off the top, send the bit of one off by fax or courier to a data entry uh, site, which would then enter the data. Um, we, ha we have to make sure that the data is okay, so we have a series of data validation checks. They would be sent back via fax again to the site for clarification. The site would then send it back. So it was quite a painful process, quite, quite awkward, um, quite difficult. And at the end of the day, once all the data has been collected and all been cleaned up, um, the investigator signs off the, the, the CRF to say, yes, this is, this is the, uh, the subject's data for this particular study. Now, that, this was obviously a long time ago, and I'd love to say that everything's improved, but by and large, I think most of the clinical research these days is just uh, electronic paper. So this, we're still entering data into, into uh, copying data into forms. Um, we're not using a pen quite so much. Um, we're just doing it straight there. Uh, the, the advantage we have over the past is um, the validation, there's no sort of lag time on the validation. As soon as you enter the data, if the data doesn't make sense, say if you enter a blood pressure of 1,200, you're instantly going to get confirmed that that's not valid. Uh, it does introduce a small problem. Um, if, well, it's actually quite a large problem, uh, a source data verification. Because um, one of the things is if you're, you're take, entering the data as source, um, which is generally the doctor's note as they're sitting there talking to the patient, um, you need to make sure that that data gets transcribed correctly into the system. Um, in the way, the way you used to do that with the old paper, you was, you'd have two people enter the same data. You'd give them both a CRF. One would enter it into one screen, one would enter it into another screen, and you'd make sure those two things lined up. The double data entry, it was called, and it was horrible. Um, now, because they, don't do, they can't do that in the same way uh, with, the, with the electronic data capture systems, they, they have to have somebody go out to site um, they don't just do this, they, they do a number of other things, but the source data verification is just making sure that the data that was captured from the subject is the same as the data that was in the, in the system itself. To give an idea of, of what a case report form looks like, um, uh, this is, a, for example, a vital signs assessment. This is taken from, there's actually a really interesting site, the medical data models, uh, where somebody's just been collected together a, a bunch of uh, electronic data, uh, uh, forms themselves. Um, the trouble with that is we obviously need to do a lot of, if we were to start pulling this stuff straight from the research systems, uh, we'd need to actually do a lot of mapping. So this is, um, on the left-hand side is the form itself. Right-hand side, um, we've got a, a bunch of mappings that we've started putting together. Um, and you'll notice there, one of the problems we do have is uh, the way terminology is handled, uh, healthcare versus research. Uh, in research, we tend to pull everything out. We don't have a single uh, med code that tells us everything about the drug. It doesn't tell us the formulation. It doesn't tell us the route or anything like that. Um, and uh, research, we have to split each of those attributes out. And each of, the, each of those attributes has to be coded to a, a specific coding system. So the, that's going to be a bridge we're going to have to cross at some point. Now, there's an example of um, taking from a fire end point. We actually did this at the first uh, uh, fire connectathon uh, that I attended. Well, we basically point a, a system at an EHR system, download two sets, like a patient resource and a medication, I think a medication statement or, or something like that, and then we, we took that data out and we pushed it across to the EDC system. Um, and the, in that case, it was Medidata Rave, which is my company's system. Um, but uh, the code's up there, as you can take a look. I talked very briefly about eSource. Um, eSource itself is, 
is something that the regulators have been pushing about for a long time. Essentially, it's saying that if you take the data as entered or collected directly by the investigator themselves, you don't need to SDV it. If they're entering it straight into the source system, um, you don't need to spend a lot of time checking that it's right. If it's entered in the source system and it comes across your system without any sort of transcription or any way, shape or form, then you don't need to SDV yet that. Um, the reason that's interesting, there's a couple of definitions of e-source, um, which I'm not going to go into a great deal. You can have a look at them if you like. Um, where that becomes really interesting, it, it, it's quite a significant, the source data verification can be quite a significant part of the, the, budge, of the budget of, for, a, for a clinical study. Um, so this is why a lot of the, the people in our industry are getting behind it, is because if you can do e-source, then you don't need to necessarily spend quite so much time or money setting, uh, collecting the data. Um, streamlines, streamlines your costs and also streamlines the amount of time you have to spend collecting the data to get them. But in the future, um, uh, this can be quite an interesting conversation if you're an EDC vendor and talking to Chuck. Um, the, the, there probably won't be two systems like this. There's, there won't be a need necessarily for a research system and a healthcare system. These two things are going to exist hand in glove. Um, until that time, we still need to kind of work, work together on this. And this is where fire is really interesting because um, the, the previous approach was using things like RFD, which were involved moving CCD documents around. CCD documents are not nice. They're very hard for us to process. Um, there's a lot of issues, I think, with actually processing and understanding what they're doing. And just sort of a second, uh, almost last comment. Um, so there's a series of use cases that we've put together for uh, like reuse of healthcare data and research. At the very top of the clock, um, something called protocol feasibility, where you have access to an anonymized population. Um, because one of the, I talked about the protocol, one of the biggest costs of actually getting a study up and running is you, you publish your protocol, you send out a sites, and you can't recruit any subjects because your eligibility criteria are too restrictive. Um, protocol feasibility use cases, you have a, basically a blank query which you can run against the patient population. And if you get back zero, you know that you're going to have a lot of difficulty uh, recruiting subjects. So then you'll have to be a wee bit more flexible on your protocol requirements. Um, and that obviously saves a lot of money because you don't have to do protocol, protocol amendments, which are uh, a place that money goes to die. Um, the next one is site and subject selection. We talked about that a wee bit in terms of actually being able to find patients for the study. Um, uh, one next round the clock is uh, basically uh, coordinating between a clinical site and or a, a clinical study uh, and standard of care um, requirements. So obviously with Medicare in the US you can get quite a large fine if you ever, uh, in a, even if you do it inadvertently, uh, pass on a research cost to Medicare. Um, so one of the ways uh, if we have a, a good exchange between the research system and the healthcare system we can tell you which, which procedures can be attributed to research and which ones cannot. Um, the next one is GWAS. Um, it's kind of hard to explain. Come and talk to me if you're interested. And then the, the final one, or the final one on the outside, is the observational study, where you, you look back at a lot of data, um, a very, very large volume of data, essentially, because you've gathered it over many, many years. And you run virtual studies where you say, OK, uh, I have two, comp uh, two drugs that are used for the um, same, same intervention. I look at the patient history over time, and then I look to see if there's any sort of undiagnosed or unidentified um, unexpected events that happen for people who take this drug versus that drug. Um, and then obviously the big one at the moment in, in the very center is the, what's called the swivel chair um, problem. The swivel chair problem says essentially a lot of the procedures you're doing as part of a clinical study um, are the same as the procedures you'd be doing um, in your normal healthcare practice. You're entering concomitant medications, you're entering medical history problems and everything like that. We need that information obviously as part of our clinical trial. So if you only have to enter it once and we can share it across the platform, then that's awesome. So we've got a couple of initiatives that are going on at the moment. Um, I've kind of run out of time. Uh, updates and examples for the research re resources. There's a project within the CEDIS group uh, looking at like bridging the, the semantics between the uh, healthcare resources uh, fire resources and uh, a model that's called CDASH, which is a capture model within CDISC. Um, integrating the lab data from using the CDISC lab model, which is a wee bit contentious, but it is, it, it's, it's another thing we can follow down. Um, actually integrating the, the whole, the, the grand goal is integrating this fire healthcare data into CRFs. Um, and there's something we're, we're going to have a play with at, play is not the right word, at the Baltimore Connectathon, about actually you, reusing the, the plan definition argonaut scheduling to 
essentially load into a uh, healthcare system all the, uh, the activities that are part of clinical study, um, which will be pretty interesting because it will help sites budget much better, uh, be able to tell the, site, uh, tell the sponsor how much it's going to cost them to run the study. Also, it would uh, go in with the, the subject calendar, for example, if they're using my charts or any other sort of uh, integrated EHR system. That would just be awesome. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.